Good morning. Welcome to Ebenezer Baptist Church. Thank you so much for joining us for worship. Psalms 102 says, Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Let's stand and sing this morning. Crown him, crown him majesty.
continue to sing about his amazing grace. singing, praising you, worshiping you, because of the God you are, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And this morning, we just pray that as you, in your Holy 
Holy Spirit to move amongst us. We pray that our hearts will be drawn closer to you. So I want to know you more, to follow you better. Convict us, God. Give us the courage to stand up, to live a life for you, sharing your love and your story to those who don't know so that they one day will be able to stand up and say that you are my God, you are my Father, that I believe in you, and that we look forward to seeing you again one day in glory. God, thank you so much for your love. Thank you so much for your Son. Thank you so much for your Holy Spirit, for caring about us, for knowing us, for being involved in our lives. in your son's holy and precious name. Amen. Children, you are dismissed. Your teachers are waiting for you. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all men. you guys here to this morning gathered for worship. We are going to be this morning in um, Psalm 33. If you have your Bibles, open Psalm 33. And as you're getting there, I'm going to go through a couple announcements <clears throat> for the week. So um, next Sunday is the Sunday we're going to be kicking off all of our Sunday evening uh, programming. So why don't we start next Sunday? Uh, adult Bible study, choir practice, and our youth uh, student meeting will happen uh, next Sunday night, 5.30. So we'll be kicking all of that next Sunday. Um, this Thursday is our monthly uh, seniors breakfast at Judd's at 
a.m. So all of you uh, seniors, you're invited 8.30 a.m. Uh, this Thursday uh, for a monthly breakfast. And uh, tonight, uh, there will be no services tonight, so no evening services uh, tonight. This Wednesday um, at 10 a.m. is going to be the first week of the women's Bible study that has been, uh, we've been talking about that for a couple weeks now, and you can still sign up for that. So women, 10 a.m. on Wednesdays, that's going to start this coming Wednesday. You can sign up in the foyer for that. Really encourage you to get a part of that if you are able and then also, um, this Tuesday at 9 a.m., I'm going to be uh, going to uh, Latrobe Drive, which is the largest abortion clinic um, on the southeast. And I'm going to be there um, to, to pray and to read scripture that morning. And so we are encouraging anyone that wants to join me in that um, to come out, um, just connect with me, let me know that you would like to be a part of that. And we're going to go there um, and to, to be a part of Love Life that has uh, people there and we'll be praying and reading scripture um, over that um, abortion clinic. Just kind of a, a tidbit about that is every day uh, somewhere between 40 and 60 um, babies are aborted in that clinic alone. Um, so we are there to, to pray and we are there to, um, to share the word of God. Um, so if you would like to be a part of that, um, let me know, and we'll, I'll connect with you about how you can join me in that um, this coming Tuesday. And then also next Sunday, we have, we've adopted a week uh, for Love Life Charlotte, where we will start on Sunday. So next Sunday, I will be preaching on the sanctity of human life. Uh, Wednesday will be a day of prayer and fasting uh, for uh, those unborn babies. And then also Saturday will be a time church-wide we'll join with other churches. And that's a Saturday morning where we'll come together as churches to prayer walk um, and to pray and to have kind of a worship service outside of that clinic um, that next Saturday. So you'll see more information coming out about that. All right. So if you have your Bibles, Psalm 33. We're going to start in verse 1. Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. He gathers the water of the sea as a heap. He puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in all of him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. The Lord brings the counsel of nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. The Lord looks down from heaven, he sees all the children of man. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. The king is not saved by his great army, a warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation, and by its great might it cannot rescue. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield, for our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. God, we thank you that we're able to gather here together. God, we're thank thankful for those that have come together this morning to make what we do this morning possible. God, we're thankful that you gave us the ability physically to, to wake from our beds and to, to come here 
to be together with your people, to gather together. And God, we know we're here to hear from you, for you to speak to us through your word. God, I pray that you enable me this morning to speak your word to your people, that they're able to understand it through the power of the Holy Spirit, to apply it to their lives, to be changed by it. God, I pray that all we do today brings honor and glory to your great name, and I pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, for those of you that are here this morning, um, there are some really important questions that you uh, may not think of, but there's the answer is there. And that is, first off, the question is, why do I come to church? Now, many of us, we may not even consider that. We may be so used to doing that, I've done that so long, that we really don't ask that question anymore. It's just what I do, it's where I go, it's what I'm supposed to do. But there's a question is, what, why do I come to church? And, and then underneath of that is really motivation. Now the reality for all of us is, we are motivated to do anything that we do. There's always motivation behind what we do. The question is, what is the motivation? For some of you, I know that there's probably been days or maybe it was work or school or whatever, and you are laying in bed and the alarm clock goes off and you think to yourself, I have no motivation to get out of bed right now. Is that true for any of you? I have no motivation to go through this day right now. Now, here's the reality, though. If you did get out of bed, and if you did go to work or school or wherever you had to be, there was some level of motivation there. The motivation is what got you out of bed. It may be that you didn't want to lose your job. It may be that people were counting on you. It may be all kinds of things. But there was something, there was a motivation in you, even on the day where you felt you had none, that got you out of bed. And today, there is a motivation that got you here. Now, the kids that maybe, you know, are young enough where somebody just put them over their shoulder and carried them here, that might not apply to them, but they're all in children's church at this point. Okay, so, but there is a motivation that is why you're here. So it's a, it's a really an important question to ask. Why are you here this morning? And here's the question you need to ask yourself. Why am I here this morning, really? What's my real motivation? And I'm sure we have a range of answers, but it's important for us to ask the question. And this morning, what we're going to see is that the psalmist actually gives us the right reason to worship. The psalmist gives us the right reason to be here. Because it's not just enough for us to have a motivation. It's also important that the motivation is the right motivation. That the motivation for being here is not just that we're motivated, that we're motivated rightly. And so in order to be motivated rightly, we have to know what is the right motivation. Why is it that we're here? Why is it that we gather? And I'll tell you. I believe throughout our country, many, 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 many people either don't know or don't have the right motivation of why they're here. And so it's important for us to look at that and say, what is it? And, and here's what we're going to see, because it's going to run counter to a lot of our motivations. Because a lot of times, here's what happens. This is what we can do subtly. We can subtly make Sunday morning about us without even knowing it. Kind of subtly happens to us. What are our preferences? What do we enjoy? What do we like? What's comfortable? What benefits us? Oftentimes, and I think all of us are guilty. I mean, I know I'm searching my own heart. I think all of us are guilty of this. We can treat church like a concert. And here's what happens. Let me, let me just give you kind of an example of how, how a concert works, right? When you go to a concert, you pay money to go see someone perform. But you don't go there to worship the person. You go there for that person to serve you. You've paid your money, you sit in your seat, and you said, hey, play for me. That's, that's, that's the point. An entertainer, right, when they go and they do concerts, here's what they're there. They're there to serve the people that have come to watch them play or sing or whatever that is 
And so what you do is you pick the type of entertainer you like, you pick the type of music you like, and you hope that they play your favorite songs. And when you go there, your expectation is, I'm coming, I've paid my dues, I'm sitting in my chair, and I'm ready for the show to begin. Very rarely do you walk into a concert and look around for ways you can help, right? I mean, very rarely you do that because it's a different mindset. But here's what we see. We see a psalmist that calls us to praise, calls us to worship, gives us the reason to worship, and gives us the response that when we truly worship this way, something happens inside of us. It causes something, and we're going to see the psalmist gives us that as well. And here's, if we, if we look at where we're going this morning, just kind of give you the, you know, fill you in. God is the center of everything. God is the center of worship. God is the center of what we do. And God is the reason that we're here. Let's look in verse 1. Shout for joy in the Lord, O ye righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. So there's a call to worship here. There's a call to the people to say, to say, this is what you're being called to do, to call in, to come in and to worship God. But here's what we see that's coming out of that. There's elements here of worship. And what are those elements of worship that we're seeing here? We proclaim God's righteousness. You see that in the first verse one. Shout for joy what? In the Lord. Shout for joy in the Lord and proclaim his righteousness. And then secondly, we see that we give thanks to the Lord. You know, when you give thanks for something, what you're doing is you're saying, I didn't do it, but you did. When we come, when we come before God and we give thanks to him, here's what we're saying. We're saying, God, you did this and not me. Right? I couldn't do this, but you did. And so we come before the Lord with thanksgiving. We come before the Lord proclaiming the joy that's found in him, his righteousness. And then it says, make melody to him. See that? Make melody. So it says, make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. Now here's what I want you to think about this. Who's playing? Who's singing? We are. Do you see that? We're performing. We're playing. We're serving. For who? For God. You see that? You see the difference there? I mean, the reason I use the, kind of the difference in the, the concert is because in a concert, when you go to a concert, there's the person on stage is playing for you. But here's the call to worship. The call to worship is the people gather together and they sing and they play for, for God. He is the center. He is the one we're serving. He is the one we're worshiping. He's the one we're singing to. He's the one we're there to serve. And that extends to the preaching of the word and prayer. It's participation. When, we, when the word of God is preached, we're participating. That's why every single Sunday, I encourage you, ask you to open your Bibles with me. You know why? Because I want you to hear from God. I want you to see the word of God. I want you to participate. I want you, as we're moving through the word of God, I want the pages to be open in front of you. I want you to be looking at that and seeing it and applying it and participating. I want you to be a part of that. I want you to go home and think about that and look at that and study that. And then to pray. Right? When, when people come here and they're, and they're praying, what are we doing? We're participating. We're not just not allowing ourselves to be prayed over. We're, we're, we're praying along with them. We are we're being brought into worship through our participation. And we are saying, God, 
I desire to hear from you. It's an act of worship. We hear from God, we sing to God, we acknowledge who God is, we participate in that. So there's a call here of what we are to do, which means that worship by its very nature requires participation. We have to participate to worship. You haven't worshiped if you haven't participated. You have to participate. We are to sing, we are to pray, we are to praise. So there's a call of what we're to do, but there's another question that we really have to answer. Not only is it, what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to worship? But then, who are we supposed to worship? And why are we supposed to worship? So it's not enough to just say that I'm supposed to to worship God. There's the question of, why am I supposed to worship God? Why is he worthy of my worship? And we worship a God who's worthy of being worshipped. Let's look in verse 4. Four reasons why we see a God who is worthy of being worshipped. One is God speaks, verse 4. For the work, word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. He gathers the water of the sea as a heap. He puts deep in the storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in all of him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood first. So first off, we see that we come to worship a God who speaks. We worship a God who speaks. We come together because God speaks. And listen to what the psalmist says about his words. Look in verse 4. His words are upright, it's straight, it's correct, it's firm, it's steady, it's faithful. Let's look at verse 5. God is righteous. The world is full of his love. Verse 6. God made all things, the heavens, the sky, all that's visible, and all the earth. The gathering of the water was done by God speaking. When you see creation and how it was formed, it was formed because God spoke it into being. His words had the power. Verse 8, the God with this power should be revered. He should be acknowledged for who he is. Verse 9, he spoke and it existed. He commanded and it listened. God speaks, things happen. We praise and worship God who speaks and there's power in his words and we remember this and i remember this every single sunday there is no power in my words there is no power in your words when you speak things don't come into being i mean when i speak i can hardly even get people to listen to me you know when god speaks creation comes into being When God speaks, things happen. When God speaks, the earth is formed. God's words have power. We come to worship a God who speaks. Which is why worship should be saturated in the word of God. From singing to preaching, the word of God being proclaimed, that is where the power is. And we can drift from that and thank God we're we're here and we're singing songs. I mean, I'm listening this morning. We're singing songs acknowledging who God is based on his word. We're opening our Bibles and we're looking at what does God say in his word. And it's so easy to drift to music that is less about words and more about the beat or melody. Preaching that's less about the Bible and more about self-help and motivational talks, we can drift from that. And here's what happens when we drift from that. You know what we're doing? We're shifting the focus of worship being about God to worship being about you. And our sinful nature will want to drift that way. We, we want to drift that way. We want it to be more about us. We want it to say, you know, I, I just want to hear something that's just going to make me feel good. Or give me some, you know, some pointers on how to live better. I want to sing some music that I like. It just makes me feel good inside when I sing it. But here's what we see. We see that that has no power. The power is found in the word of God. 
And so the power in a, in a service, in a gathering, we come together and, and worship God is found in the word of God. And that's why the word of God is front and center in all that we should do. Secondly, we have a God that speaks. We have a God that rules. Verse 10, the Lord brings the council of nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The council of the Lord stands forever, the plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. So God rules over all things. Regardless of how people respond, regardless of what people think, God is sovereign. We worship a God who is over all things. We worship a God whose counsel doesn't fail. It stands. It says, blessed, prosperous, blessed is a nation whose God is the Lord, the one true living God. Blessed is a church where Jesus rules and reigns. Blessed is a family where God's word is over all things. God is sovereign, God rules, God reigns. God is the one who is worthy of worship. And then thirdly, we see that God sees. Verse 13, the Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man from where he sits enthroned. He looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds, he sees. Here's a reminder for you this morning. God sees, and God knows you. God sees you, God knows you. God knows the numbers of hairs on your head. He knows your thoughts. He knows why you're really here this morning. He knows your heart. You're worshiping a God that knows you. He knows your fears. He knows your insecurities. He knows your anxieties. He's the one true living God that sees and knows. He is the one true living God that truly knows you and sees you. And here we are to worship that God. Some of us may get up, we put on a happy face, we think about how we're going to respond to people, we try to maintain an image, we're concerned about how we're going to look or how we're going to think, but here's what happens is when we gather together, and we sing and we hear from the God who speaks. We hear from a God that knows you. He knows how your week went. He knows why you're really here. He knows what you're struggling with. He knows where you are. He knows your thoughts. Have you ever walked into church on, one, on a Sunday? Felt like the sermon or Sunday school lesson was talking specifically to you. Have you ever had that feeling? Where you're like, I felt like I was the only person in the room. Like they must have known something. You know, how'd they know? Or when, or when, you know, I've heard many times where the Sunday school lesson and the sermon kind of connect together perfectly and we didn't plan that. Or when sometimes it just things come together and you feel God speaking, it's because there's a God that knows and sees and knows you and there's power in his word. You, he brings his people together. He speaks to you. He reminds you of this. I know you. When you, when you feel that feeling of God speaking directly into your life through his word, here's what he's saying. He's saying, look, I know you. I see you. I understand you. I, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're going through. He's a God that sees us. And so worship is acknowledging this. It's coming out of our hiding places and recognizing God sees us and God knows us. And then verse 16, God saves us. The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation, and by its great might it cannot rescue. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. It says here, the king may have a great army, but that will not save him. A warrior may have great strength, but that will not save him. That these things eventually will fail you. We come together and worship to recognize that we do not have the power to save. 
that we are dependent, that we are helpless, that we, we come together, we acknowledge that about God, that I may be a king of a large army, but that's not going to save me. I may be a, a warrior with great strength, but that's not going to save me. I might be out in the world, and the world tells me I have all that I need. I have everything it takes, but that's not going to save me. We come together, and we worship the God who saves. It says in verse 13, all, 17, all those things create a false hope in us. But we worship the one true and living God, the one true and living hope. And this points us, even here, at this, this psalm, it's, it's pointing us, it's foreshadowing us to Christ. God who saves us. And Jesus is the manifestation of that. Jesus is the, the Jesus who was God's one and only son. Jesus who was born of a virgin. Jesus who came and lived a perfect sinless life. Jesus was, was the person who lived the life you couldn't live. Jesus was the one who came and paid your debt by dying on the cross for your sins. And Jesus was raised from the dead, defeating death, because we worship a God who saves and week after week we come here, we gather together and we acknowledge that and we remember that whatever is going on in your life, you don't save yourself. We worship a God who saves. And today we celebrate that Jesus came, that God has saved us. We gather to worship a God who saves. The cross is a symbol of that fact that we have a God who saves. And then let's look at our response. So when we, when we worship this way, when we come together, when God is the center of our worship, when God is the center of our praise, when we're, we come together to acknowledge that and these things about God that we're acknowledging, these things that we're lifting up, these, these reasons why he's worthy to be the center of our worship, the center of our praise, it changes you. Verse 20. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in him. Because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us. Even as we hope in you. So here's the response to our worship. This is what happens when, when we truly worship the one true and living God. When we truly make God the center of our worship, when we, when we come together and we let the, the power of the word of God do the work in us, when we acknowledge God for who he is, when we make him the center, guess what? It changes you when you worship that way. There's three things it produces in you. One that we see in verse 20 is it produces patience. It says we wait on the Lord because he's the one who can help us. Do you know what produces patience in you? When the one true living God, the only one that can help you, when you acknowledge that, you wait on him. You know why? Because he's your only hope. It's kind of like when, um, you know, there's been a couple times where, you know, Misty and the kids have been locked out of the house. You know, and... I may be, you know, a certain amount of miles away or whatever. Well, when, they, when she calls and says, hey, I'm locked out of the house, and it's been a long time since this has happened, but she calls and says, I've been locked out of the house, and I say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm going um, to be on my way. You know what produces patience in her? Knowing that I'm the only one that's going to be able to unlock the door. Knowing that she can't take matters into her hand, own hands. There's nothing that she can do. Like, she's powerless right now. I felt the same way actually for her one time. I, was, I, I locked my keys in my car, lost them. I was uptown Charlotte, and I was like, Misty, you're it. You're my only hope. <laughs> like, you've got the only key to this car. You've got to come rescue me from this. And guess what happens? There's patience, because here's what I know. She's it. There's no other options. I'm not getting in that car. I don't have a key. I can't do anything else. So here's what happens. When we worship God this way, it produces patience in us. Because here's what we recognize. Here's the problems that I'm facing. Here's the situations that I'm facing. Here's the mountains that are in front of me. Whatever that is for you, here's what you acknowledge and worship. You acknowledge, but God is the one 
who is in control of all things. God is the one that knows. He sees. God is the one that speaks through his word. And God is the one that saves. He is my only hope. And therefore, because he is my only hope, my soul will wait for the Lord. So first off, it produces patience. Secondly, it produces trust. Look in verse 21. For our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. See, when you acknowledge who God is, when you acknowledge and come together and we worship God, you are trusting him. When you acknowledge that he's your only hope, you're trusting him. You're putting your life right in his hands. You're saying, I I can't, but God did. I can't do this on my own. I can't make this through this day on my own. I don't have what it takes on my own. But here's what happens. I come and I worship the one true and living God that can. And I trust him. And you know what that makes? Makes our hearts glad. Because God is a God that can be trusted. God is a God that we can trust. And it makes us glad in him. Because we trust him. This one true and living God, we trust him. By acknowledging who he is and reminding ourselves of who he is. And then in verse 22, let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us even as we hope in you. So worship leads us to hope. You know, for many of us walking through life right now, there's a lot of things in front of you. There's a lot of problems that are in front of you. There's a lot of situations that are in front of you. There are a lot of situations and things that you don't know the answers to or what to do. And it's easy for you to continually be focused on what do I need to do with this situation? What do I need to do with this situation? What do I need to do with this situation? Right? And you may even come to church, and you, all you want out of God is, God, just give me, give me some advice on what to do with this situation. Or, God, just, just give me an answer. Or some of you may be so consumed by the situation, you're like, I ain't even got time for the Word of God. I ain't got time for church. But you know what happens? When we acknowledge God for who he is, when we remember who he is, when we lift our eyes off of the problems, right? And I'm not saying they go away. They're still there. But when we lift our eyes off the problems and we see a God who speaks and his words have power, a God who sees us, who knows, a God who rules over all things, and a God that saves. Week after week, when we acknowledge those things, when we remember those things, It allows us to have hope. So it may not be that things go better, but we have hope in the one true living God. It takes the focus off of us, and it puts the focus on him. And I want you to think this morning, when you worship that way, when you come to worship on Sunday morning, and you say to yourself, that's what I want to be. I want to come, and I want to serve God today. I want to hear from God today. I want to make God the center of all that I do today. It makes some of the stuff that we get concerned about sound silly, doesn't it? I think about that for my own life. There's things that I have been stressed out about, things that I have been concerned about that seem really silly. When we have the word of God and we are able to come together as his people and to acknowledge him. Acknowledge a God and make him the center of our worship. You know, one of the things that we see week after week is that we have people that gather here together. You know what they do? They're they're not playing their instruments for you. They're not singing for you. They're singing for God. They're praising God, and here's what they're doing. They're encouraging you by doing that for you to do the same. That's what they're doing. That's what they're here to do. They're here to to play their instruments, to sing their songs, to, to bring the praise to God, and that is leading you, that's what called leading into worship means, is that you are being led to do the same. That's what you're called to do. 
you're being, you're being encouraged, you're being led, you're saying, hey, look, look at these people, they're coming, they've gathered together to, to play, to sing, to sing praises to God, and here's what happens, you're being led to do the same. And I'll say as we close, Christian, you need this. You need to worship. You need God to be the center. You need to have that peace and that patience and that trust and that hope that is produced through true, authentic, God-centered worship. The world we're living in isn't getting easier. Your life is probably not getting easier. You need this. You need to come together and allow the word of God, the power of the word of God, and re be reminded of who God is. We, we worship a God that speaks. We worship a God that rules. We worship a God that knows. We worship a God that saves. Let's pray. God, thank you for who you are. Thank you, God, that you brought us here today because we need to acknowledge who you are. We need to be reminded of who you are. We know that all of us, it's so easy for us to drift. It's so easy for us to fall away from that. But God, we are thankful that you are a God that's given us your word, that's instructed your people to gather together and to be reminded week after week of who you are. God, I pray that whatever we're going through this morning, whatever situations are present in the lives of your people here today, I pray that in the midst of that, that they will see who you are. They will see your love, your mercy, your kindness, your strength, your power, your provision. They will see that you are the one true living God. God, I pray for anyone in this room this morning that may be on their own, trying to save themselves, trying to be good enough, trying to do enough. God, I pray that through the power of the Holy Spirit, that some eyes may be open today to the truth found in your word of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That Jesus came, lived the life we couldn't live, died the death that we deserve, stood in our place, paid our debt to free us from our sins so that we, through his righteousness, could be made righteous before you, a God who is perfectly holy and just. And God, your word says that all that call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. God, I pray that if there's a person today who's not called on the name of the Lord, God, I pray that today would be that day. God, I pray that as we enter into this time of response, God, I pray that you would search our hearts, examine our hearts, examine our motivations. Allow us to recognize why we're here, why you brought us here, that you love us enough to bring us here to make yourself the object, the center of the worship, because you are a God that loves us, a God that knows that we need that, a God that is worthy of that. God, I pray that you lead us and guide us and direct us, and all that we do brings honor and glory to your great name, and I pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So as we stand and sing, this is a time for you to respond to the word of God. As I said earlier, the word of God has the power. The word of God is what saves. The word of God is what does the work. And so however the word of God has done a work in you this morning, wherever the word of God is bringing you to respond, as we stand and we sing, this is your time to respond to the word of God. Mm -hmm.